you Parag again and uh, Rohan thank you for simplifying my job uh, actually uh, this is the probably the most commonest presentation of the uh, hand injury that we see in practice the dinner fork deformity a traditionally of police fracture and as Rohan has uh, said that we require x-rays we are totally dependent on x-rays occasionally a CT scan what is most important in these x-rays is that you have to look at the dorsal angulation and dorsal combination in a fracture and you have to see the sharp polar spike on the lateral view. These two according to me are the uh, determinants whether a close reduction is going to succeed, a K wire is going to succeed or what problems you have in store for you. And the commonest thing or this is probably the first surgery that we do in residency first major surgery apart from suture removal and implant removal is putting a K wire in the distal radius. Now various combinations of K wires uh, have been practiced and I will not go into that. A retrograde wiring, trans styloid pinning or even the Kapanji technique. These all are fine. They work very well if there is no combination or but most probably both, um, most of the problems are when there is a collapse it is cause loss of reduction and that is mainly due to two things one is that we underestimate or we don't calculate the amount of dorsal combination especially in elderly people and we don't calculate the volar spike if the volar uh, spike is not reduced properly then we have this loss of uh, we have got this loss of height a positive ulnar variance and a dorsal tilt in fact, a positive ulnar variance, in my opinion, is more disabling than a volar tilt and eventually it leads to a, a painful restricted forearm motion. In my opinion, a painfully restricted forearm uh, motion, a, a painful supination and pronation probably is more disabling than a restricted wrist movement. So, we go to this case of an extra articular fracture. This was a relatively younger patient. You can see even in this case, there is a dorsal collapse, a dorsal spike here and this volar cortex is not reduced. You can see that the volar cortex is not reduced. Now, unless you reduce the volar cortex, no amount of K-wiring is going to succeed. And in addition to uh, uh, this thing, always you will have a hidden or un un unknown dorsal combination. So you always must give a slab, keeping the wrist flexed and always reduce the volar cortex. If your volar cortex is reduced and then you uh, whatever uh, pinning you do you have to support it with a dorsal slab and that's the uh, fracture which is healed and that's the volar cortex which is very well reduced you can see that even the dorsal cortex has fallen in line the slab has to be maintained keeping the forearm in supination and the wrist flexion for about three weeks and very important thing while inserting a k wire when you want to insert a K-wire through the radial styloid, identify the superficial branch of the radial nerve, identify these two extensor tendons of the first compartment, isolate them and then put in a K-wire. Don't do it without that. When you want to put a K-wire through the dorsum or from the uh, lateral aspect, identify the EPL tendon or the common extensor tendons if you want to do a Kapanji technique. And then only you put a K-wire. Don't do it blindly. If your tendons get stuck up there or get impaled by the k wires, then there is, will be a big problem. So in the post-operative phase, when I treat the patient in a plaster, if and when I treat the patient in the plaster, I always give a below elbow, above elbow POP slab for about three weeks. The elbow is maintained at 90 degrees. The forearm is supinated. The wrist is flexed to give a dorsal periosteal support. The thumbs and the wrist fingers are kept free and I mention or ensure that the patient is doing a shoulder abduction right from the first day. That is the way the patient is enjoying the exercises. You can see that the patient is extending and flexing the fingers and even abducting the shoulder. So there won't be any shoulder hand syndrome or any shoulder stiffness in the long run. Now this is again a case I would like to again reiterate that this sharp volar spike causes the loss of reduction or that means that the reduction is not well maintained. The dorsal angulation and combination is very important. You can see with the radial solid, we must remember is a slightly volar structure. And then the K wire has to be passed one right in the midline here and one K wire has to be passed slightly on the dorsum to give a good hold. 
and that's how the volar cortex is reduced and that's the post op picture of this patient treated in a plaster and you can see with this all these precautions you can see all the radiological parameters are very well maintained in this patient now that is not the case in every case the dorsal comminution is quite extensive now if you ask the options in this case the first option will be a plate second option also will be a plate and third option will be also a plate but i came across these articles way back in 2002 and 2013 and we kept on wondering whether we can use it for our cases and this case we are treated it with this patient uh, with this method we use a closed reduction we reduce the volar cortex and this is a minimally invasive technique by which two anti grade wires 1.5 mm in diameter are passed in this manner one wire goes to the radial uh, or radial volar corner one wire goes to the dorsal medial corner the third and fourth wire are uh, one power wire is passed interfragmentary and one wire goes intramedullary now the wires are cut superficial to the tendon the skin is closed and in this case also a plaster is given you can see uh, all the radiological parameters are well maintained initially immediately post op also this paper is under review for publication by the way so now in the we always compare with the normal side you can see that there is a restoration of all the radiological parameters in the follow up all the all the four x rays we are we are taking oblique views pa and ap and in the lateral view and this is you can see a, it is a minimally invasive surgery there is hardly any scar there is no problem there is no tendon or nerve problem in this method you can see a very good result here and that's the implant removal and you can see that all the parameters are very well maintained by this anti grade nailing technique in which it does not allow the collapse in face of dorsal comminution here that's a pre op for comparison the advantages of this method are that it maintains the reduction there is hardly any collapse the cost is very minimal in front of a plate the place cost about 40000 rupees an imported plate this cost the material cost about 2200 rupees only there are minimal complications if necessary if if desired you can augment it with an external fixation in a comminuted case and you can also do it in children as i can i'll show you this is a epiphysis sparing technique This is a case where a badly displaced fracture, not amenable to a closed reduction. This was treated with anti-grade nailing. This is immediate post-op X-ray. That is at one year post-op, and that is the complete function that is regained. The growth also is normal. This patient has uh, gone on become a doctor now. Now this is a case where this is a comminuted fracture with intraarticular extension. You can see that there is some amount of bone left here. we will always do a ct scan in this case to assess the prognosis or assess the problems now in this case i use this ao type of external fixator where we use a fernandes type rod to rod clamp here and this advantage of this rod to rod clamp is that you can put the pins anywhere you want in the uh, metacarpal and in the radius and then you do a close reduction you can augment it with external uh, k wires and then you connect this rod to rod clamp and get the desired position desired ulnar deviation desired flexion that is very important in this dorsally comminuted fractures if you get the desired flexion and maintain it with this rod to rod clamp your external fixator will serve as a permanent method of treatment and we encourage shoulder and hand move movements in this case and that's the result after implant removal and that's the uh, normal and abnormal side for comparison and that's the final follow up now here again uh, option would be in this case in uh, probably in this era when dorsal plates dorsal distraction plates are available why do external fixator that also is a very viable option i did a external fixator in this case only because the dorsal plates were not available this was done out of bombay and you can see very important is to restore the drug as i have said that intraarticular fracture will not give a problem if the mid carpal joint is normal and the drug is normal so in this case we opened it dorsally put a bone graft maintain this flexion with a rod to rod clamp here you can the advantage of this is you can change the assembly if you feel necessary now you can see at 6 months post op the carpal alignment is maintained the drug is maintained the ulnar variance is maintained the intraarticular step up does not matter because anyway we expect the radio carpal joint to become stiff but however mid carpal joint will compensate and you can see this is a very good result at 6 months post op for this particular case 
now this is the last case now this also is a very good indication for a plate but i felt that clinically there is a lot of combination imported plates were not available for this patient at that time and there was intraarticular extension and patient was not affording a plate imported plate that would have been very good for him so i treated with a closed reduction and external fixator you can see again this fernandez rod to rod clamp is in action it helps to maintain the wrist in flexion now when the pins are going into the second and third metacarpal you will always expect mp joint stiffness here so this uh, fixator we have attached it to the mp slings a splint and you can start splinting and start mp joint flexion right from the first day even in spite of the fixator and you can see that fracture is healing very well here and that's the uh, hand in motion we in spite of the fixator that's the fracture which is completely healed and that's the function after about one and a half year you can see even he has got a very good flexion very good extension here full rotation of the forearm absolutely painless and fully functional now the message i want to give is that try to use minimal uh, less diameter pins 2.5 mm pins are very good ao type of clamps are very good and you take limited incisions while inserting radial pins keep the mp joint flexed while inserting the hand pins the shoulder and hand joint should be moved right from the first day to minimize the stiffness the intramedullary kys you can insert them for assisting or maintaining the reduction if the distal ulna is unstable or gets displaced you can stabilize it also in brief you can say that i like to use the fernandez classification for shear fractures i prefer k wires you may or you can also use a plate for bending fractures you must use a plate uh, or sorry uh, i i think i got it wrong for shear fractures you should use a plate the bending fractures you should use only k wires for compression fractures you can you must use a plate you can combine it with external fixators avulsion fractures mean are generally amenable to uh, k wires and combined fractures you can use the combination of all of them i thank you all for your attention